マイナスワン Godzilla Minus One is a film that's not just about a giant monster stomping around, but a deep dive into the soul of post World War II Japan, a time when the country was as battered and bruised as a boxer after 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. Director Takashi Yamazaki is not just rehashing the old Godzilla scares here, he's weaving a narrative that's just as much about human trauma. Guilt and redemption, as it is about monster mayhem, tapping into the dread of Japan in 1947, still reeling from the war and twitchy about the US Soviet saber rattling. Here, Godzilla isn't just a big, scaly metaphor for nuclear terror, he's the embodiment of every nightmare keeping us up at night. But Yamazaki doesn't stop there. He dives into the psyche of a nation stripped of its defenses, grappling with the mental and physical scars of war. It's like he's put the collective trauma of Japan under a microscope and invited us all to have a look. The director throws us back to World War II, but with a twist that makes even history buffs do a double take. Our man Kochi Shukashima, a kamikaze pilot who's more into living than dying gloriously, pulls a fast one by pretending his plane's got hiccups and lands it on Odo Island for some quote unquote repairs. Enter Sasaku Tachibana, the sharp mechanic who smells a rat and gives Koichi the side eye, suspecting he chickened out on purpose. Cue to a typical island night. The mechanics are jolted awake by sirens, only to find themselves in a Jurassic Park rerun with the introduction of Godzilla. This isn't your granddad's Godzilla, though. It's a pre mutated version. A sort of T Rex meets Godzilla Saurus hybrid, but with less impressive fins and a snout that's a throwback to its Tyrannosaurus cousins. This dino pedigree gave him a fantastic suit of abilities. Think dinosaur instincts, but with the dial turned up to 11. He was about the height of a four story building and boasted a strength that made human efforts look like child's play. He could also outrun a human without breaking a sweat, as the unfortunate mechanics on Odo Island find out. Despite being given a chance to play hero, Koichi freezes up in fear, essentially turning the mechanics into a midnight snack for Godzilla. The next morning, he wakes up to a scene straight out of a horror film, with Tachibana playing the gravedigger for the Godzilla buffet victims. Tachibana, understandably miffed, blames him for not taking a shot at the beast. Cut to a ruined Tokyo, where Koichi's neighbor, Sumiko Ota, chews him out for still breathing, considering he was supposed to be kamikaze toast. She drops the bomb that his folks, along with her kids, are casualties of an air raid, one she believes could have been prevented if he'd had more courage. Our protagonist is carrying a boatload of survivor's guilt and battling imposter syndrome, making him the poster boy for this era of Japanese angst. He's dodged death more times than he can count, but at what cost? And his story is a slice of the larger tale of a nation trying to stitch itself back together. In a twist that even M. Night Shyamalan would envy, Koichi finds himself with a baby, courtesy of a thief turned instant mum, Noriko Oshi. After some heart to heart, he discovers Noriko isn't the baby's mum, but took her in as a dying wish. In a move that surprises even himself, he allows Noriko to crash at his place. The next day, Sumiko, still not over him ditching his kamikaze gig, gives him a piece of her mind, but still hands over some rice for the baby, because even in post war Japan, babies trump grudges. Fast forward in Kochi, Noriko, and baby Akiko are playing house. To keep the pantry stocked, he joins a minesweeping crew, because why choose a safe job when you've dodged death? He's basically haunted by nightmares of Godzilla's island rave, but hey, they've got to eat. The crew's a very quirky bunch. Kenji Noda, aka Doc, the leader and scientist with a penchant for wooden boats as metal ones trigger mines. Yoji Akitsu, the captain, has got a one liner for every occasion. And Kid, the rookie who's green, but not in a Godzilla way. Meanwhile, Godzilla, not one to miss out on the nuclear party at Bikini Atoll, gets a radioactive glow up. This leads to an angry Godzilla playing battleship with US vessels. And with Uncle Sam and Russia playing Cold War footsie, Japan gets a heads up, but no help. Cut to 1947. Kochi is now BFFs with his crew, and even Sumiko's warming up, babysitting Akiko while he's at sea. 
while Noriko, not one to be left out, decides to hustle in Ginza for some extra cash. Yamazaki decides that just one Godzilla showdown isn't enough for our protagonist. Its main, Kochi's crew is playing a game of distract the monster while waiting for the battleship Tako to show up and hopefully kick some kaiju butt. Of course, being the party crasher he is, Godzilla decides to attack the other minesweeping boat, leading to a high seas game of cat and mouse. Our crew drops a mine, but unfazed, Godzilla just shrugs it off like it's a bad joke. The second mine gets a grand entrance into Godzilla's mouth, but the line gets cut. And in a stroke of genius or madness, Kochi decides to play sniper with the boat's machine gun, and bam, Godzilla's face gets a new look, and for a moment, it looks like our boys have won. But no, Godzilla's got some Wolverine level healing, and he's back in action in no time. Enter the Tako, all guns blazing, but it's like throwing pebbles at a tank. Godzilla, annoyed at this point, dives underwater and then lights up like a Christmas tree for turning the Tako into fireworks. The atomic bomb basically transformed the already formidable Godzilla into a kaiju nightmare. He ballooned to a whopping 50 meters, turning him into a veritable skyscraper of muscle and might. Everything about him got a monstrous boost, from his strength, speed, agility to reflexes. He could now take down destroyers with his bare hands, swing his tail to demolish buildings like they're made of cards, and casually toss trains and heavy objects as if they were toys, while his durability made bullets and explosives about as effective as throwing marshmallows at a crocodile. Even his own atomic breath, which could singe his face, was a mere inconvenience. Godzilla's senses were also finely tuned, making him a nightmare for vessels trying to play hide and seek. Post-nuclear spa day, our scaly foe now sports a more muscular look, complete with bumpy, scarred skin that would make any dermatologist cringe. He's also got a cheek scar as a souvenir from the mine explosion, and eyes that could win a gold medal in the staring contest Olympics, and those dorsal fins, bigger, badder, and more jagged than ever. Back in Tokyo, Koichi's having a bit of a crisis. He spills the beans to Noriko about his kamikaze past and the Odo Island Godzilla rave, and wonders if he's actually been dead all this time and just doesn't know it yet. However, Noriko, being the rock she is, assures him that he's very much alive. But Godzilla's not done yet. He decides to take a stroll through Ginza, and Noriko unfortunately gets a front row seat on the train. Godzilla then chomps down on the carriage like a prehistoric dickhead, sending Noriko diving into the water for safety. Koichi finally finds her, but their reunion is cut short by Godzilla deciding to test out his atomic breath on some tanks, creating a wave of devastation. Paralyzed by the explosion, Koichi is saved by Noriko, who ends up taking the hit. Shikishima, now in full anguish mode, watches Godzilla strut away, leaving a path of destruction in his wake, and lets out a gut-wrenching and primal scream, indicating his fear is turned to hatred. It's important to note that Godzilla is not just a muscle-bound monster, he's got some smarts too. On Odo Island, he was more of a curious observer, only throwing a tantrum when they started shooting. But post-nuclear spa day, Godzilla gets wise, connecting humans to a sudden glow-up and deciding to make anything human his personal punching bag. What's terrifying is that Godzilla's as comfortable in the water as he is on land, pre- and post-atomic makeover. His atomic breath also works underwater too, Chasasa Takao, which got vaporized in a flash. The piece de resistance of his arsenal is a blue ray of atomic annihilation, preceded by a light show from his dorsal fins, starting from his tail and moving up his back. When he unleashed it, it wasn't just a blast, it was an event, creating mushroom clouds and shockwaves that flattened everything. Much to everyone's surprise, the big guy's healing factor is off the charts and post Ginza, the place needed a quarantine thanks to Godzilla's radioactive leftovers. But Godzilla's not invincible, he has an Achilles mouth as Koichi discovered with his well-placed mine. His atomic breath is also a double-edged sword. It hurts him as much as it hurts others, needing time to heal before he can use it again. When it comes to Godzilla's personality, let's just say he's not the forgiving type. He's got a grudge against humanity for turning him into a radioactive monster, and he's not shy about showing it. Back in 45, he was just curious, maybe a bit cranky, but post-mutation, full-on rage mode. He's not just angry, he's a walking, roaring embodiment of vengeance, taking out his fury on anything and anyone. Yamazaki decides that a few simple monster mashes just isn't enough for our war-weary protagonist. After Godzilla turns Ginza into his personal playground, leaving a trail of destruction and a heartbroken Shikishima swearing revenge, we find our hero plotting to give Godzilla a taste of his own medicine. The Japanese government, in a move as surprising as a rain shower in the Amazon forest, decides to do sweet fuck all about the impending Godzilla sequel. Enter Kenji Noda, the man with a plan so crazy it just might work. 
He rallies a bunch of citizen soldiers and outlines a strategy that sounds like it's straight out of a sci-fi novel. Surround Godzilla with Freon tanks, pop them to send them into the deep, and hope the pressure change turns him into a prehistoric pancake. And if that doesn't work, they've got plan B. Float the big guy up quickly and hope he pops like a party balloon. Noda's got a fleet of decommissioned destroyers at his disposal, but he needs naval volunteers and a pilot for a special mission. And Takochi, a kamikaze pilot who's finally ready to meet his maker. He's on the hunt for Tachibana, the only mechanic he believes can turn his flying jalopy into a Godzilla-seeking missile. And after a few failed attempts and some angry letters, he finally tracks down Tachibana, who's less than thrilled to see him. But when he lays out his kamikaze 2.0 plan, Tachibana can't resist a call for redemption, and agrees to pimp his ride with some serious explosives. The climax is where the director really brings it home. He shows a ragtag bunch of veterans and everyday Joes banding together against Godzilla. It's not just about defeating a giant monster, it's about rebuilding, moving forward and making a stand. This moment is a metaphor for unity and the power of working together, so the next generation doesn't have to contend with the same devastation. We cut to a heartening scene at home where Akiko shows Koichi a drawing that would melt even Godzilla's heart. But duty calls, and he leaves a wad of cash and a note for Sumiko to take care of Akiko, just in case he doesn't make it back from his date with destiny. Not one to be stood up, Godzilla resurfaces and starts wreaking havoc. In a daring display of aerial acrobatics, Koichi lures Godzilla back to the water, where Noda's trap is set. Godzilla takes the bait, falls for the Freon trick, and gets a one-way ticket to the ocean floor. But just when they think they've got him, he chews the balloons and gives everyone the slip. Luckily, more volunteers led by the kid arrive to put Plan B into motion. And just as Godzilla is about to unleash his atomic breath again, Koichi swoops in like a bat out of hell, flying straight into the mouth of the beast. It's a fireworks display like no other as Godzilla's head explodes, sending chunks of monster flying everywhere. Much to our surprise, Kochi, ever the showman, parachutes down to safety, revealing that Tachibana had installed an ejector seat in the plane, telling him to live in a heartwarming exchange. And back on dry land, Koichi reunites with Akiko and Sumiko, who hands him a telegram revealing that Noriko, his lady love, survived Godzilla's Ginza Gala. At the hospital, he finds Noriko alive but radiated, asking if his war was finally over. As he embraces her, we see a mark on her neck shaped like Godzilla's dorsal plates, a souvenir from her encounter with the King of Monsters. But there's a twist. A piece of Godzilla's flesh lying at the bottom of the ocean starts to regenerate. For 70 years, Godzilla's been the big guy on campus, evolving from a 1954 radioactive metaphor into a global box office hit. With Godzilla Minus One, Yamazaki isn't just adding another chapter, he's rewriting the book. The maestro of this monstrous orchestra conducts both the pen and the camera with a deft hand. His scenes aren't just shots, they're strokes of genius on a canvas that's as emotional as it is visual. The guy's like a DJ of drama, mixing high-octane monster action with those quieter, introspective beats of guilt and reflection. It's a film that doesn't just resonate, it reverberates through you. At the heart of this kaiju carnival is Godzilla himself, and Yamazaki's take on the big guy is something else. His beast is a complex creature, a blend of old-school charm and new-school menace. He's terrifying, no doubt, but there's a depth to him that's just as intriguing as it is fearsome. The design is a homage to the classics, but with enough alterations to make it fresh. And those atomic breath scenes, they're like watching destruction turned into an art form. But Yamazaki isn't content with just delivering a monster flick. He dives deep into the murky waters of blind nationalism, challenging the very concept of loyalty. He weaves this theme into the story like a master craftsman, ensuring the film isn't just a visual spectacle, but a thought-provoking exploration of loyalty and the human condition. The movie isn't just a parade of gloom, though. Yamazaki balances the trauma with a glimmer of hope, especially with young Akiko and the kid. They're the future, the symbol of a new generation that'll grow up in the shadow of the war's devastation. They're why Kochi and his crew are duking it out with Godzilla. And Tachibana's ejector seat in Kochi's plane isn't just a cool gadget, it's a metaphor for hope, a symbol of breaking free from the self-destructive habits of the past. It's about moving forward, not being shackled by history. The resolution of Koichi's arc is a study in character development and narrative closure. Having faced and conquered Godzilla, he finds himself at a crossroads of personal evolution. His journey from a man haunted by his past to one who actively chooses life and hope is a resonant theme. The transformation is not just about overcoming external monsters, but also the internal demons of trauma and guilt. The chorus of characters urging him to formalize his relationship with Noriko is more than just societal expectation. It's a reflection of his unspoken yet profound love for her and Akiko. 
This emotional undercurrent runs throughout the film, culminating in their joyful reunion at the movie's end. It's a fitting conclusion to a story, one that brings his arc full circle, from a man burdened by death to one embracing life and love. Yamazaki is also not afraid to throw a few punches at the Japanese government's past. He takes a hard look at how they treated their own citizens during the awful times of World War II. Koichi starts off as a reluctant kamikaze pilot, seen as a coward by his peers, but by the end of the film, he's the poster boy for thinking outside the box challenging those old, rusty notions of honor and duty that usually lead to nothing but a one-way ticket to the afterlife. Godzilla Minus One is a balancing act of epic monster chaos and heartfelt human drama. We're not just here to watch Godzilla tear up the scenery, although that was heaps of fun. We're here for a story about trauma, hope, and what it means to be resilient. The director has crafted a film that's as entertaining as it is thought-provoking, leaving us with a takeaway that's more nourishing than a hot bowl of ramen on a cold night. Sure, Godzilla might be the big name on the poster, but it's the human stories that really make the movie tick. It isn't just your run-of-the-mill kaiju kerfuffle. It's a masterclass in character-driven storytelling, with a cast that brings every nuance to life. Front and center is Ryunosuke Kamiki, giving the film a raw emotional core by tackling the emotional minefield of PTSD with the kind of intensity that would make a lesser actor run for the hills. Manabi Hamabe, on the other hand, opts for the less is more approach. Her performance is a quiet storm, contrasting Kamiki's raging tempest with a soft optimism. The supporting cast function as the perfect balancing act, each bringing their own flavor to the mix. Munitake Aoki is the enthusiastic scientist, a bit too keen at times, but always on the ball. Kuranosuke Sasaki's ship captain is a man of layers, dishing out one-liners that cut through the tension like a knife through butter. Then there's Yuki Yamada, whose eyes are open to the horrors of monster warfare, a poignant reminder of lost innocence. Hidetaka Yashioka and Sakura Ando are also very crucial. They're the window into Kamiki's world. They're challenging perceptions of his actions, adding depth and dimension to the narrative. Godzilla Minus One isn't just another entry into the Godzilla Chronicles. It's a standout, a film that marries personal stakes with top-tier visuals, a sound design that's like music to your ears, and a score that could stir the dead. Yamazaki doesn't just reinvigorate the franchise, he gives it a new lease on life, proving that there's still plenty of gold to mine in the Godzilla lore. The film is more than just a blockbuster, it's a cinematic classic in the making, a testament to the enduring appeal of the Big G, and the power of a well-told story. He channels the spirit of Jaws in the aquatic sequences. It's like Spielberg's iconic tension, but with a Godzilla-sized twist, maintaining an atmosphere that keeps you on the edge of your seat. Sure, the finale might not hit the same highs as the rest of the movie, but it's still a damn fine capstone to a symphony of storytelling. It transcends its monster movie roots. It delves deep into the human psyche, exploring the themes of guilt, redemption, and the quest for meaning amid chaos. Yamazaki's direction masterfully balances the personal with the colossal, creating a film that's as introspective as it is visually spectacular, a poignant reminder of humanity's enduring spirit in the face of overwhelming odds. And made on a shoestring $15 million budget, it puts Hollywood's bloated wastefulness to shame. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore Godzilla Minus One. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about this film, so please share that in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.